Welcome to the Cubus Podcast. In each episode, we will be meeting the individuals who can give us real insight into the problems, solutions, and people in our technology industry. Hi all, welcome to the latest episode of our Cubus podcast. I am Georgia and I'm an internal account manager here. And today I am joined by Peter and David from Sentinel One. Thank you both for coming along today and biding the time to speak to us to find out a little bit more about Sentinel One. If you could briefly give us an introduction on who you are, what you do, and how long you've been at Sentinel One, please. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, George. Firstly, thank you for inviting us. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And uh, my name's Pete Carfrey, so Senior Channel Manager at Sentinel One. Um, scarily, been with Sentinel One for kind of six years. So I've been on that journey for a while. I'm kind of the, the old man of the team, if you like. So um, but delighted to be here and to share uh, some of the thoughts of, of what we're doing and where we're going. My name's David McKissick. So I'm Channel Solutions Engineer at Sentinel One. Um, six months is my tenure here in the business, so still learning the ropes. Cover Northern Europe, so UK and I, Benelux and Nordics. And um, yeah, looking forward to doing this podcast with you. So Sentinel One can be seen as relatively new within the market. Tell us a little bit more about when the company started and where you are today present in the industry. Yeah, it's a good question. And um, Sentinel One is still, yeah, it's still relatively new business, really. It's about 11 years old. Um, Israeli founded by Toma, but now seen as a US business. You go out to Silicon Valley and get the funding and all of those sorts of things. Um, but the market that we're in is, is super competitive. We're typically known for being in the endpoint market, and we'll talk about the change in that and where we're moving to and things like that later. But if we think back to 10, 11 years ago when Central One was, was founded, the endpoint market was very different. For 10, 15 years, it had been dominated by the likes of Sophos and McAfee and Trend and Kaspersky and a whole host of endpoint vendors that did a really good job of selling antivirus. And that was the way that the, that the market was. It was antivirus based typically on signatures. Um, and they had a lot of success that way. And, and actually, it was a company called Silence who came and changed the game in the space. They brought in this thing called... Um, behavioral AI, and it was this, it's kind of termed as the next generation of antivirus. So essentially antivirus on steroids is, is, is what they brought out. And, and it was looking at the new types of attacks out there and using behavioral AI for the first time to look at that and prevent during an attack. And that really changed the game significantly. And Sentinel One came about because of some of this movement and because the market was looking at two things, EPP, endpoint prevention, and EDR, endpoint detection and response, were two very separate product fields. You had the guys I mentioned already doing the prevention, and you had somebody or vendors like Carbon Black doing the, the EDR. So once you'd been breached, they would, do the, they would detect that and they would respond to it. And Gartner was saying that by, I think it was by 2020, but I can't quite remember exactly, that actually what customers are looking for is a combination of both EPP and EDR within one single product. And Sentinel One was created to be that product. CrowdStrike came along, and that's the one that everybody always asks me about. So, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about CrowdStrike later. But um, CrowdStrike came around a, a little bit before Sentinel One and the same premise. We, our architecture is very different, but the premise was doing that EPP and EDR within that one single product. And that's what Sentinel One did, and it came to market. And, uh, and back then, you know, when I started six years ago, no one had heard of Sentinel One. It was Sentinel Who. Uh, and we're coming into an incredibly noisy market with established vendors. Um, but if you think about it from a technology point of view, if you were a Sophos or a McAfee or a Kaspersky, and you're seeing the market move on to this next generation of, of, of you know, um, bringing in behavioral AI, and needing to have an EDR component as well, what do you do if you've got an existing technology? Well, typically what you have to do is you need to acquire somebody or you need to build it yourself. Building it yourself is super expensive. So a lot of our, a lot of our competitors would go and bolt solutions on. And this is where you get layered solutions with lots of different agents. You get performance challenges there. Sentinel One came along and had success because when we were able to show people the technology, they could see the real advantage 
and actual power of the technology because it was designed to do EPP and EDR in one single agent. And the others would struggle with some of that because they were layering technology on existing technology. And you struggle to get best of breed that way. So as I say, it's taken some time where Sentinel One's not been a known brand. We still have a long way to go, but I think we've made great strides in, in make, making Sentinel One a brand that people know mm -hmm. and trust and a technology that, that really works. And we've expanded the, the portfolio and the platform. We have a platform story now, so we're much more than just Endpoint. I'm sure we'll come on to some of that, but hopefully that gives a little bit of context on the history and where we've come from and what we're doing. Thank you so much for your detailed response there. And it's, it's interesting to find out where you guys have started from, the growth that you've experienced. Where would you say you are in today's industry and what's the plans going forward? We're in a really unique position at the moment. So as Pete said, we've covered the EPP in the EDR side of things. Where we're really looking to move into now with great success is around XDR, so extended detection and response. It's being able to take in logs and feeds from other vendors that our customers use and be able to then interrogate forensically and threat hunt around those logs. So an example could be you see a threat on your endpoint but you want to understand how where that threat's come from. Maybe it's come from an email that's come into the business through one of your integrated vendors. Maybe it's come from um, a web link that's been clicked on. So XDR is all about taking in those logs from additional vendors, understanding how that means from a, from a threat perspective, and then creating actions on the back of that. It's all going well with Sentinel-1 being able to stop an attack or to remediate an, uh, a threat, but being able to then force a user to log in through that, their identity provider or restrict them going to websites through the secure gateway is a real key element of what XDR does. And that's really where Sentinel-1 are uniquely placed. And then we've got the data side of things as well, which, we, which we'll talk about sort of through, throughout this podcast. I think to build on that as well, you, you to ask about where we are in the industry and, and where we're going and, and, and XDR is, is super important. And it's, it's been really interesting to see that journey through time, you know. Again, when I started, it was EPP was king, you know, having good protection was super important. And then this new term of EDR people were learning about and, and what have you. And, and over time, that transition where having good protection was just like a tick in the box. It's like, a, well, of course I want good protection. But the reality of, of the, the nature of attacks today, and it was all accelerated by COVID because there's more devices, more data, more users, and it's sprawled further than it's ever been before. So protection is difficult, but actually guaranteeing that nobody gets breached, nobody can do that. Um, and even as we sit here as Sentinel-1, we have really good protection. We can't guarantee that a customer will never be breached. So what customers actually care about, and, and we saw this transition over time, was, well, when we do get breached, how, can we, how quickly can we remediate and respond to that breach? Because essentially that is reducing their risk. The nightmare scenario for a CISO or an IT director is once they've been breached, they phone their, their SOC team or they phone their MSP provider, whoever it may be, and say, Guys, we've been, I hear we've been breached. What's happened? Mm. When? How? Which user? Which device? All of these types of things. And if the answer back is, I'm not sure. Give me 10 minutes. Give me 20 minutes. Give me an hour. It doesn't really matter what that time frame is. That's a scary thought because you don't know what that risk is. You don't know what hackers have potentially got access to. You don't know if, you've, if, if the attack is still going on what assets they've got, all of these sorts of things. So EDR became really, really critical and is still critical today. And most of our conversations are, uh, have changed from that protection conversation to detection and response. And when you're having those types of conversations in the enterprise space, it's really becoming down to three vendors that we see, which is Sentinel-1, it's CrowdStrike, and it's Microsoft. Um, and we have a very, very good POC win rate against all, all, of the, all of those types of vendors. So we're very happy to have them conversations, but as David alluded to, and something we'll talk about is data moving forward, is that we're, we're becoming more of a data platform. But it's been really interesting seeing that transition of the market over time, 
and obviously trying to predict where it's moving to in the future. And, and I guess we'll get into some of that as, as we go on this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like we said, it, it's always an ever-changing market, isn't it? So it's exciting times for you guys as you grow and develop. And the journey and the growth that you've experienced so far is one of the reasons why Cubus were really excited to become partners with yourselves. So tell us, how does that channel model support you? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because we can talk about technology and as the channel guy, I should probably take this one, right? Okay. So um, we can talk about technology and uh, you know, speeds and feeds and all those types of things. And of course, you need a really good technology. That's critical. But actually, I think one of the biggest successes, um, and it's not just because I work in channel, but our model has always been, our strategy has been channel first. Um, we are 100% channel. And I've worked with vendors in the past that are 100% channel, 80% of the time. And that's a problem. And, and it's a real difficult thing because how do you build up trust if you have sales guys that in theory could take deals direct if they needed to? Somebody's slightly off their number and there are rules and guardrails in place, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, with other vendors. But there's still that possibility that a vendor could take something direct. So we've never had that mantra. We said very early that everything we do will go via channel. So we have our distributor, which is exclusive networks. We have partners like Kubus, and I'll talk about the importance of those partners in a second, but it's really enabled us to scale incredibly fast. You know, if you think when I was at Sentinel One in the early days, at one point there was two of us, you know, without the channel, we would not have survived. You know, coming into partners like Kubus, who are able to take our message, take it to your customers, be that trusted advisor, uh, has just helped to scale. We can't touch every opportunity. So being 100% channel is an absolutely critical um, stru uh, strategy for us and something that has, I think, had a significant impact in our acceleration. And, and one of the key reasons why we've grown so fast, that strategy isn't changing. We're still reliant on the channel. But when we talk about working with channel partners, we can't work with everybody. We're in a really good position now. And again, if I think back all of them years ago, um, it was tough, right? Trying to get Sentinel One into partners and saying, hey guys, come and sell us. We're a great pro great technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now we have the opposite problem where a lot of partners are wanting to work with us. That's a great problem to have, but the challenge is that we are still a very small team. You know, we're less than 50 people in the UK. Um, we have to remain really focused. So we look at a couple of key things. The first thing is, does this partner, and this is a key reason why we're working with you guys, do they have the technical capabilities to be able to take customers on that journey? Really understand our messaging, not just EPP and EDR, but the XDR and the data set messaging as well. Take a customer from start to beginning, demo, POC, be able to handle the commercials, and really help us to scale because, like I say, we can't touch every opportunity. So that's a critical thing. The second thing we look for in partners uh, so first thing is kind of self-sufficiency. Second thing is, is around, can this partner take us into a new market or take us into a new vertical or somewhere, maybe a new geography, somewhere where we're not particularly strong or that we have to grow and we have to focus on. So those are the two areas we really look for. And when we choose a partner and we focus on that partner, we focus in terms of marketing, our time, enablement, all of the key things to make sure that you're a true extension of our team. And by doing that, we want you to make good margin as well, right? So, um, th and there's certain things that, that I'm very particular about with, with our channel, and, and David would have seen this in some of the meetings uh, that, that I do, and I call it out. We don't do arrogance. We don't play politics. We don't play games with deal regs and things like that. We'll support the partner that's done the work, even if they're a smaller partner up against a big, you know, a big well-known partner. Um, I don't want to hear, it's not my job, you know, from Sentinel One colleagues. You know, we're, we're all got to support the channel. Um, and, and, and if we can maintain that type of a culture, be fun, be approachable, then I think partners are going to want to work with us and continue working with us. Because as much as, as we enjoy making money, it's got to be fun at the same time. So partner relationships are absolutely critical to everything we do. It's why we have this man from a, a pre-sales point of view to help support the channel as well, because um, it's, it's just a critical part of our strategy. 
Absolutely. I mean, we're all striving for the same success, right? So if we can build that trust and that relationship with you guys from the start, then ultimately we're going to work better with you and achieve that success. Talk to us about your product portfolio and where you're seeing the most success with your customers, our customers. Yeah, so the, the, the portfolio has grown massively. So I've been at the business for six months and since then I've seen a lot of changes already. What we're looking at introducing is, is a wider platform play. So Peter, when you mentioned the platform side of things, what we're looking at doing now is really moving into a data perspective. So I've been in the industry for the best part of 20 years now. And over those years, everyone's talked about data. Data is, is, is key to customers, but you can have not too much data, but how do you manage that data? How do you interrogate that data? So what we've done at Sentinel One through an acquisition we made a year, a year, year and a half ago, Scalar, is create our own security data lake. So we're taking all the XDR and EDR information into the data lake. And we've then realized that we can use that data lake to essentially pull in logs and information from other, other products like firewalls or secure gateways or identity providers. And we can then use our, our data lake to then start querying that data as, as a whole. And, and we can do that really fast. So the scalar acquisition has, has meant that we can do this interrogation, this reporting, this analysis faster than our competitors can. But the great thing about how we work and, and, and how we've implemented this solution is if we take Splunk, for example, massive vendor in the data space, we can do what's called Splunk augmentation. Customers who have Splunk in their business already, they can continue to use Splunk, but we can ingest some of the logs. So rather than going to Splunk, they can go to Sentinel One. They can still use their Splunk investment to query Sentinel One. So any existing reports, any existing workflows that a customer may have through Splunk can still go through Splunk, but then filters into Sentinel-1 as well. And we can do that a lot faster than Splunk can as well. So there's a lot of, the data play is absolutely massive. And I think that's something that's only going to grow in time for, for, for Sentinel-1. So alongside data, we've also got the identity part of things. Again, yeah, ab absolutely key, being able to understand the risks with inside your Active Directory infrastructure are absolutely key. Being able to run assessments from the same console on maybe have you got complex passwords set up? Have you got too many users sitting in your domain administrator's account? Again, it, it, it's fundamentally important to mitigate those threats early on. Pete also touched upon the challenges that were faced during COVID. And if we look at the state nowadays, the user's devices are everywhere. Being able to look at those devices for identity attacks, not just on the domain controllers, but on the laptops themselves, again, absolutely key, because those threats can man itself to, as it manifests itself as an entry point into the network or into other devices. So identity alongside EDR, XDR, EPP, and the data aspect is fundamental to what Sentinel-1 does. So tell us, what can the customers, partners expect from Sentinel One in the next six to 12 months? Yeah, I, I, I'd love to be able to predict the future, but it's, um, look, I think you're gonna see a continuation from Sentinel One of, of, from the channel side, real focus. I think you'll see increased resource, you know. Um, we have an absolute drive to be profitable. We're a public company. We had a, the most successful IPO in, in history a couple of years ago. Uh, um, which is fantastic to be part of. But I think all of the things that David's touched on and when we're talking to customers, they're, they're talking about being able to consolidate agents, being able to consolidate vendors and do more with less. And I think especially in with the macroeconomics at the moment, it's really, really tough uh, environment for everybody. Um, they're looking for, for that consolidation. That's an opportunity for, for us, an opportunity for our partners because what we have with our platform is the ability, and, and one of the other metrics we talk about and acronyms, because there's not enough in this industry apparently, is, is um, NRR, net retention rate. 
And sentinel one is consistently around 130 to 140 percent um, NRR, and essentially that means for every one dollar that a customer is spending on day one, by the time they come to renew, it's it's a dollar 34, 35, whatever it may be. So I expect the continuation for partners to be able to con to upsell at a regular. Uh, as a regular motion with Sentinel-1. So you may start off and land in, in Endpoint, which is typically still what we're known for, land, land in terms of protecting and providing the EPP and EDR. But then it, as a partner, it gives you that opportunity to go and have a conversation about, well, we, uh, what about protecting cloud? You, know, you containerize workloads of Kubernetes environments. What about protecting your mobiles? Um, what about identity? What about data? Are you a Splunk house? Can we augment your Splunk and reduce your costs, that, your costs there? So there's lots of opportunities for partners to, to grow with us. And I, I would say that you know, we're really skimming the surface in terms of the opportunity because we are primarily known as an endpoint company. And you're going to see us start to transition more and having those data conversations. Um, cloud conversations. And I think that will take us to that next level. It will help us to differentiate ourselves um, and have different conversation with customers. And for partners, it means you have more to sell um, and you can go and pivot those conversations. So that's really exciting. I think that's the exciting piece is we're growing so fast as it is. But if we get it right and we get the messaging right, and I'll go to market and we're with the right partners and our enablement is right, then I think we have a great opportunity to, to significantly impact the business we're doing today. I don't know if David, if you've got anything to add. Yeah, the only thing I really want to add on that is some of the initiatives that are, that are taking place in Sentinel One. So we announced the other day um, Threat Ops 3, Threat Ops 3 workshops. So this is a capture the flag game that we can take to our customers, so existing and new customers. We can take to our partner base as well. And it's a really fun um, way of learning how Sentinel One works. Mm -hmm. Doing a capture the flag type of scenario. You can do it individually, you can do it as a group. So that's something else which we're really excited to take to our partners again and to our customers as well. Thank you to both Peter and David for joining us on our um, Cubus podcast. Um, I'm sure you're filled with a bunch of knowledge um, to go away and digest. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we will see you again for our next episode. Thank you for joining us at the Cubus podcast. We hope you enjoyed the chat. Remember, there are more conversations in the series. Just search for Cubus wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe.